Hi, everybody, and welcome to the latest in the series of IFC webinars. Today, we're going to be talking about, and we've got a range of panelists, and we're going to be talking about the early careers experience in the crisis and actually beyond you know, what might the future look like um, as we start to come out of the, as the coronavirus crisis. Uh, my name is Steve Isherwood. I'm Chief Executive of the IFC. Um, if you haven't tuned into one of our webinars before, um, we keep all the audience on, on mute, um, but you can ask questions. We really would encourage you to ask questions. So just use the dialogue box that's within the platform. If you've got the questions up there, um, I'll keep an eye on them, and I'll either ask them to the panellists as, as we go along, or I'll ask them at the end. And um, please keep your questions brief, though. Um, I've always struggled with multitasking, so trying to, to read a long question whilst, um, whilst we're posing questions or panelists sometimes get, gets a little, a little bit, bit, bit tricky. Um, we do record the webinar, um, so you can access it afterwards if you want to revisit any of the points that were covered, or please do share it. You know, throughout this crisis, we've made our webinars and podcasts available to everybody um, in the spirit of, um, of collaboration, cooperation and, and, and networking. So, so do please feel free to share. Um, so let's get stuck, stuck straight into it. Um, we, we expect it to be around about, about an hour. As I said, I've left time for questions at the end. So if I can get our panelists to, to introduce themselves, I'll go around them as I can see them on my on my screen so that way I won't, I won't miss any of you out as it is. So Nicola, would you like to go first? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. So I'm Nicola Sullivan, Solutions Director at Meet and Engage. Um, we're candidate engagement technology, live chat, chatbots, onboarding platform. Um, we work with the likes of the Amazons, um, Deloitte, Met Police, and, and they use effectively use our technology to improve and enhance their candidate experience, um, whether that's live chat events, automated screening, or, or, or actually um, virtual onboarding. So great to be here. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Nicola. Um, Michael, would you like to go next? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Nathan. I look after the Emerging Talent Programs at MACE. We're a construction and consultancy company. Uh, and prior to that, well, I've had similar roles in the financial services, banking, and retail sector. Um, and you're also a sector champion for the IC, aren't you, Michael? Yep, sex lead for the Built Environment Group. So if there's any uh, Built Environment employers who haven't yet been to some of our, our sex focus groups, uh, as well as some of the online communications we've got, feel free to get in touch and I can hopefully get you to join our growing community. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Vanessa, would you like to go next? Hi, sure. I'm Vanessa Curve. I'm a creative designer at Carve. Um, I kind of, I work on the social media. So we're a social media agency um, in the recruitment space. So I'm part of the team that looks after the content strategy and actually produce the content that you'll see on our clients' feed. Um, so we work with professional services. We work with uh, confectionery good manufacturers. Um, quite a range of, of clients. Um, so yeah, that's me. Cool. Thanks, Vanessa. And last, by no means least, Steph. Hi, I'm Steph Bishop. I have spent about 15 years working in the early career space, um, worked for IBM, Alexander Mann Solutions, and most recently I was head of early careers at Capgemini. I recently left Capgemini to set up um, Tomorrow's Talent, which is a future talent consultancy um, to help employers either set up or transform their early careers programmes or um, reskilling programmes to help people back into the workplace. So interesting time to uh, set up a new business just before a pandemic, <laughs> but hopefully yes. we'll be able to uh, yeah, help some way in getting the economy back up onto its feet. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, they say if you can survive in a crisis, then that sets you up for um for for for, for life. So, um, so <laughs> definitely good luck with that step. And did you used to be a sector champion as well um, for the digital I was group? I the digital sector. Yeah, yeah. I'm still in touch with them, and I'm involved in the apprenticeship steering group as well. Fantastic. Great. OK, so let's get stuck into, into the meat of the, of the webinar. At first, I think what we'll talk about are the sort of the key challenges you know, this current crisis is, is creating. Michael, would you like to go first from a, from a MACE perspective? Yeah, thank you. Um, thinking about that question, I think there's two areas of change. It's the tactical and the strategic. The tactical has a number of factors that I'm guessing are fairly common with a lot of our you know, people who do similar well across different sectors. So obviously we've got a new intake joining us uh, this year, some which already started, but with most coming September. Um, in some areas, we're dealing with having to move people around because we've got some areas of the business that are doing well and growing. Others ha have suffered maybe more than others. So actually their, their readiness to take new people is, isn't as strong. So how do you deal with moving people around when the individual graduates or apprentice may have had an initial plan that's now something different 
for their first role in the organization. Uh, and then linked to that, regardless of whether they got the same role they were expecting or different role, how do we make sure that we really get them joining the organization effectively, have a very positive or continue to have a positive onboarding pre-joining experience, but actually then onboarding into induction, how much do we support them or how can we support them effectively, but actually the line managers, it's always, you know, that, that key internal population will need a lot of guidance uh, on how to do their role working in a very different working pattern than they may have been doing so before the pandemic. Uh, and then looking ahead to uh, the future, which we normally be doing at this time of year, what, what, what does the business want in terms of new graduates, undergraduates, apprentices for next year? And already those discussions aren't as clear um, or, as, or, as, or as succinct as they would have been that, that people are having to think more in an uncertain business climate. Um, and we're a, an industry or an organization that certainly has you know, real areas of growth it, it, despite or due to what's been happening and areas that just aren't growing as much as they used to be. So how do we look ahead to what the business looking for next year? And then in, in our team's uh, response to that, how do we go out and, and attract and select you know, effect, you know, candidates effectively using digital tools, maybe only using digital tools and maybe not having as much kind of physical presence on campus or other types of events, as well as how does that selection process fit? So those are the tactical, and then um, the strategic uh, is really, you know, is there. What are the skills and roles we need to cope with what the new sort of way of working as a result of the pandemic requires from our sector and from our organisation? Um, you know, some industries have been looking at this. We are now looking at this more. You know, data analytics, digital technology, those are skill sets that we may not have looked at to bring in and support with a talent pool joining us as graduates or apprentices. Looking at the balance between graduates and apprentices in the UK, you know, the government uh, announcements and, and incentives and supports have been very much focused on apprentices. There hasn't been too much explicit mention of graduates. Um, and then the final and, and, and something that is, you know, permeates and should permeate everything, a really strong focus on diversity and inclusion. You know, that's really being talked about every level of our business and our, our industry, which is, you know, welcome. But that isn't an easy topic to really drive solutions to. So that's probably a summary of both tactical and strategic uh, issues that we're dealing with. And, and Mark, am I right? You were, at, you were at Lloyd's at the time of the financial crash. Does it, does it feel quite different, or is it? Is it? You know, are, are some of the obviously it was very different. The, the cause and effect, and it must be quite different at the bank at that time. But, but is actually sort of the impact of hiring and the way that your business is responding now. Is it, are there similar parallels with with that time? Um, thinking back now, uh, I think from uh, what uh, Lloyd's had to cope with at the time of the the biggest challenge then was the merger between Lloyd's CSB and HBOS. And, and that happened at a time where they had graduates about to join each of those previous separate organizations. So most of it was a, a tactical challenge. So how do we get them on board and changing terms and conditions and understanding now we have the Lloyds Banking Group identity and how do we induct them? Um, so actually, um, I think being a cut of numbers either in the middle of the financial crisis and in the years afterwards. Um, I think what was consistent well what's been a more positive uh topic of conversation with senior stakeholders has been we can't switch the tap off of talent you know where you know a lot of organizations or some high profile organizations from memory have to just or chose to stop that intake of, of graduates and undergraduates but because apprentices probably weren't in the same space that we talk about them now that certainly has been uh, not something that you know, senior leaders at Mesa have wanted. Everyone talks about the challenges that created when it was done in the, in the last UK recession, if not global recession. And I think that's a positive. I think it's just the challenge of uncertainty of being able to provide the right experience and the right opportunity and to deal with the business cost and investment at a time when bottom lines are under pressure. And um, Steph, apart from setting up a new business in a, in a rather challenging time, what are kind of, I guess, what are the, the key challenges that you see facing our, yeah, our so, industry at this time? Yeah, I think that um, like, your point there, Michael, about the, the economy being really volatile at the moment, it makes workforce planning super difficult. 
Um, and I think that when we're in times like this, if you perhaps consider moving from an annual cycle to maybe multiple intakes throughout the year so that you have a much more agile process. Um, but if you do that, I, I mean, I've, I've always worked with organisations that do that anyway. Um, my, my advice would be just to um, make sure you've got governance in place with your stakeholders and you're really embedded within your, your businesses that you're hiring for so that you can spot any likely fluctuations in demand. But I think it's really important that that stakeholder engagement is, is really close and you're working really close to the business if you're going to go move to that kind of model. Um, and also being really transparent with your candidates candidates in the process because we, the, the future is so uncertain suddenly the demand could get switched off so it's being really transparent with your candidates and making sure that they are aware of what if the demand is being cut and then helping them maybe move to different roles and things like that so I think a lot of work needs to be done to make sure you've got control of what your demand is during difficult times like this um, other other challenges I'm seeing is that um, obviously there's a huge drop in apprenticeship vacancies in the Department of Education have reported nearly a 50% drop of new starts during the lockdown period compared to the same period last year and the number of vacancies on signed apprenticeship site has dropped by 67% again in that same period so I just don't know whether the incentives that the government are giving is enough to increase the opportunities. And so we're going to see huge numbers of people uh, out of work and school leavers and other people becoming unemployed. So the volume of applicants and candidates will increase. Um, and so it's how do you, when your funnel is so large, ensure that you've got a really fair process and efficient process to ensure that you are assessing candidates fairly um, and that the candidate experience is, is really good um, and that, that your process is inclusive and, and not just taking easy decisions. Um, and, you know, there's so much focus on, on, on diversity and inclusion at the moment, but I do worry with, with um, a squeeze on budgets that perhaps some of those DNI initiatives that were in place may get sort of pushed down the, the, the pecking order a little bit. Um, so I think it's, it's really advisable to automate as much as you can um, within your process without in negatively impacting that candidate experience. Um, I'm currently working with a construction firm um, and they're setting up their first apprenticeship programme and it's a level two apprenticeship and we are anticipating a huge volume of diverse candidates um, applying um, and a huge range of ages and experiences coming through. So I'm working with them to ensure that the decisions that they make are making are the right decisions and ensuring that they are equipped to make those right decisions and that our process is choosing the right candidate and maybe not yeah, they've got to have unconscious bias about what their typical person is that they want to recruit, but that's not the right, obviously, approach to take. So I think more focus on yeah, accepting different types of candidates who are maybe older um, or maybe from different backgrounds is super important at the moment when you've got that funnel. So it's, yeah, working through how you, how you make that process efficient and also really a fair process. And there's loads of great tools out there, like Meet and Engage, for example. They've got fantastic chatbots and you can have live chat sessions. So keeping your candidates engaged through the process, using tools like that are really efficient ways of keeping candidates engaged in your process through recruitment and through to onboarding. So um, there are tools to help you. It um, just might need a, a bit of investment in that. Um, but I don't think, well, for organisations I've worked with, that we've worked on a cost for hire model. Um, and it, 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 because of your volume of application may not necessarily mean you get more budget. <laughs> um, so it's how do you do more with less um, is, is, is a challenge. Yeah, yeah so I think that's, that's, I can see that theme very much coming to a lot of the conversations yeah. we have that, yeah, it's having to do at least the same, if not more, with, yeah, with, with definitely shrinking. Yeah, if your hiring budgets. target's the same, you've got to recruit the same volume of people, but got this much yeah. broader workload how do you do that efficiently and fairly 
Um, Nicola, well, I think a bit later we'll come on to some of the more, I guess, specific yeah. things around actually the, you know, the, the interactions that you have with your clients at the moment. But just in broad terms, I mean, this must be very different. This, this is the, the, the challenges that you're dealing with aren't probably quite what you thought you'd be dealing with. I mean, if we go back to, to, to January, um, <laughs> yeah. are, are some things the same or is it radically changing the way that, that, that you go about doing what um, I think it's probably fair to say that we started the year with a business plan um, and while we're on target figures and what that is actually the way in which that's made up is different to how we anticipated it. It, 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 it changed as, it, as life did for all of us overnight really. Um, I, I think the sort of key challenge that we're supporting our clients with is, uh, and I, I quote actually one of our retail clients, she said I've, I've never in my life as a recruiter um, attracted, assessed and selected and onboarding someone without meeting them. And I think there's this, this experience we've all been through where, um, you know, at least two or three times during a recruitment process, we'd anticipate meeting the business in some way, whether that's our team, whether that's the office, whether it's our hiring manager. So I think where we're really seeing, um, and we've really sort of step, stepped up and supported our clients, I guess, is, is that bit of how do we put that wrapper of engagement around what, you, what is now a completely virtual recruitment process for many. Um, whether we'll ever go back to as much face to face, I don't know. That will sure we'll have that debate a little bit later. But yes, that's certainly where we've seen the sort of spike in our activity. Um, and I think Michael said something a little bit earlier, which resonated as well, which was that you know that sort of there's tactical and there's strategic. I think Q2, and we, we're a calendar quarter, so Q2 for us, we, we saw a lot of not panic buying, but a lot of quick, quick. We need to do this. And very quickly, in, in beginning of Q3, we're now seeing conversations being much more strategic. People are thinking, well, this is probably going to be broadly how we need to work moving forward. To varying degrees, virtual is probably going to be here um, for life. Um, and people are being much more strategic about how they're now deploying technology. So it's been a very interesting, she says in <laughs> inverted commas, very interesting year so far. But that probably summarises where, where we're seeing most activity. And what about yourself, Vanessa? Do you recognise all those those key challenges? I guess you have those, and then then some different ones from from the work that you're involved with. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, thank you. Um, so some of what Nicola was saying definitely resonated, um, especially kind of just having something planned and throwing it out the window. Um, so we work with clients that operate globally um, and it meant that the content calendars that we had no longer seemed to fit in um, we kind of had to be hyper aware of, of covid and how it affected different parts of the world so that the roles that were being advertised reflected that um, making sure that the right message is going out to the right regions um, and so yeah you know it meant it meant turning things around a bit quicker um, getting sign off quicker um, but it was really crucial in terms of um, kind of mirroring what was going on in the world rather than just carrying on as normal as it, it, it wasn't appropriate uh, so that's how we've had that was one of the main um issues we came about that's interesting actually because we just put out um, a global report yesterday actually talking about what's not in every country but in, in, a, in a you know across a whole number of regions and it's interesting how everybody's been affected by by coronavirus but i'm guessing what you're saying is that the, the pace has been different in different countries, different rates of infections, and also, you know, I guess in Asia Pac, um, those countries are starting to emerge out the other other side now, which is something you've had to respond to. Absolutely, we've had to start drip feeding that back into into our content plan, like we originally had done, and um, making sure, you know, if, if there's an outbreak in another place, can we pause that campaign? Can we revisit it, restructure it, and make sure that we're just saying the right things at the right time? Um, just a reminder to everybody listening, um, if you've got questions for the panel, please do please do use the question box, just pop them into there and I will, and I will pass those questions on to our, to our panel members. Um, just going back to you, Michael, um, Steph was talking about um, both the diversity piece and also actually this, this concern about the jobs market for you know, sort of next year and, and I guess possibly even the, even the year after. We, um, Going back to the financial crash, we saw that actually it wasn't the year of the crash that had the biggest um, um, hit in vacancies, it was the year after. And a bit like you said, we've seen this year that employers have pretty much stuck with their hiring acts. There are very few that have had to rescind or, or defer offers, but there is that worry that that means they'll almost be full of capacity into, into next year. Mm. So you do, do you have any, I guess it's a double prong question, one is about worries about you know, the lasting effects of this episode on future talent, but also from a diversity angle. Do you think that might even be 
harder for, for candidates from more diverse backgrounds? I think if nothing changed, if the debate wasn't raging as it should do, and, and you know, in, in some ways it's it's a welcome debate, albeit maybe the causes of the debate being so present weren't weren't are, are not welcome. And I think that's the difference. You know, I think the level and the, and the, and, the, and the pervasiveness of the discussion about diversity is so so much stronger than at the time of the financial crash. I I think it's. It, it's absolutely crucial that it's 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 much higher up the agenda than before, and and what's interesting if you look at you know the public uh, the social mobility commission's report on the impact for the apprenticeship levy to say that actually it hasn't given the social mobility that maybe was part of the the goal of it, but I think now certainly for an organisation such as us there are much more stronger levers that will influence behaviours in industry and ultimately that's from government. So as a, as a, as a uh, supplier to government, we've historically done a lot of work to uh, fulfil requirements on, on, on key contracts that we are delivering around the diversity inclusion space. And that has been maybe not, you know, that's been a, a, an effective tool because if you put a commercial driver on your supply chain, they, are, they, will, they will behave in, in, in the way that you're looking for. And given that there seems to be the need for government spend on infrastructure and other projects that will you know, seen as kickstarting and, and uh, maintaining the economic recovery, I think that will be unavoidable for anyone who's looking to deliver work, and and therefore it will affect us, and it will affect the work that our team does for the business. That we will have more of a, a business need, as there's always been a business need, but it'll be much more short-term pressing to ensure that we are attracting talent from the widest part of our community. I think that's the difference. I think it will be harder because to, to, to point, the pool of candidates is going to be huge. And how do you balance the fact that sometimes the candidates are maybe easier to identify and, and succeed in your current process? You, how do you balance that when actually you need to do work to make sure there is equal access and an inclusive approach to your select, attraction selection processes to allow you to, to bring in a, a, a more diverse uh, you know, pool of talent. Um, and I think that's um, the positive challenge that all of us are going to face because it will be a much more business imperative or stronger business imperative for a company like ours to, to be better than we've been before. Is that something you recognise as well, Steph? Both, I guess, you would have seen that in your previous roles, but also in the in the in the people you're working with at the moment. Yeah, I think that there's. I, I do worry about um, yeah youth and employment. Uh, I think it's going to be long term, sort of scarring effect on um, people who are leaving education now or who've been made unemployed. And I think particularly from um, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, the scene from the, from from previous decades is going to be there's long term effects with lower pay um, in the future, further unemployment, sort of reduced life chances, and and potentially mental health issues and um, so I, I, and I also worry about um, uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds with um, virtual processes and virtual internships where they don't have the technology or the environment to participate in those that that gives puts them at, at further disadvantage so it's what 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 more can we do to support and I know there's all, an, an awful lot of charities out there that are doing lots of work at the moment um, and it'll be interesting to see how the kickstart program um, pans out and the detail behind that um, and whether that's going to have any impact in, in supporting the these, these these individuals but yeah as I say I said before I do worry where there's lots of businesses that are really struggling at the moment um, are they going to be able to facilitate taking on a trainee do they have the time to dedicate to them to support them um, and also yeah with, with businesses just being in, in financial difficulties are they going to be able to support the DNI initiatives that that they had in place, yeah, and yeah, but and I also worry about the negativity as well because there are opportunities out there. Um, you said before that actually, the for the ISC members, you haven't seen that much of a, of a drop in, and um, organisations are fulfilling that demand. Um, so there are still, I mean, I think as a as an industry, we need to make sure we're shouting about those opportunities because 
uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds may think that they can't compete um, in in because they, they you know, have don't have the role models to give them the confidence to apply. And now they're seeing, seeing so many more people applying for jobs that I, have, I, I haven't got a chance of applying um, to, of, of succeeding in the process. So I think we need to just share good good stories um, and say actually it is achievable and you can do this. Um, otherwise, we're going to see we have what happened in previous economic. Um, down downturns where yeah, people are, are, are impacted for decades ahead. Yep. Vanessa, is this something you see coming through into the messaging or the campaigns that you're building with 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 your clients? The concerns that, that Mike and Steph are talking about. Um, I wouldn't say it's anything that we've necessarily had to look at at the moment. I mean, some of our clients have really been hot on on diversity and inclusion in the creative that we that we produce all the time. One of our clients, you know, that is at the forefront of what we do, making sure the message resonates, especially when they are advertising globally. Um, but I do have to agree with what what Steph is saying um, and Michael. You know, that, that more needs to be done um, when we look at board level diversity. Um, you know, we could be doing more and how do we do that? Um, I think apprenticeships and internships are the door for these people. So, um, you know, a lot of our businesses that we work with, they see the candidates coming and they see the future leadership potential. So we need to ensure that these opportunities are still available um, and do what we can if you can. But like you said, in terms of virtual learning, that, that may not be possible for people of all backgrounds. So how do we tackle that? How do we look into that? Mm. So do you have worries for the sort of this current class of call it the 2020 class of, of, of students? Um, I talked to what said they've been called the Zoom generation. Um, and as Steph had alluded to, you know, people's suggestions, I guess the cohorting group of graduates, you know, they have suffered over taken five or ten years for them to get to the you know, get to the same level as their, their peers did. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's going to be a massive deficit, not just for the youth that are coming up into these roles or could be coming up into the roles, but for the companies themselves. There's going to be a gap of knowledge that, that like you said, you'll see in 20, 30 years or so. So, you know, there's, there's two angles there, two really solid reasons as to why you should ensure that diversity and inclusion is massive now and just those gates are open and not just kind of dipping into the pool and finding the easiest candidate and training somebody you see who has potential. Mm -hmm. And Nicola, you're, you're nodding your head there. Do you also have some yeah, similar I mean, concerns about your know, lasting effects? Yeah. Everything everyone has said, I've, I've been nodding away because it, it's absolutely um, spot on. I, I guess there's some responsibility um, as a technology provider, but also for our clients and those we work with. Um, I, I do believe that if we work hard enough, technology could start to be a bit of a leveller rather than a disadvantage. Not in all cases, but actually if we think about the work we've been doing in virtual internships, for example, um, uh, obviously over the recent weeks, um, there is an argument to say it's slightly more, um, or so, sorry, slightly less uh, worrying or, or, or alarming for someone to take a virtual internship than it is to turn up at head office in Canary Wharf, for example. So is there a way in which we can work with technology to make sure it's more of an um, a leveller, making things more accessible? Um, I think we just need to keep an eye on that and make sure it's exactly what we do do with technology, because we are going to varying degrees be virtual on and off um for a period of time now um but no i can't everything everyone said is is is, is absolutely what we're seeing and what we um are worried about too and my point is we've started talking about actually what the what the future might look like and this sort of coincided with the question i was going to ask with um, a question we've had through from bonnie who's um who's listening in got us like a radio host there <laughs> um, so bonnie asked <laughs> what, what is the best change improvement you've seen to the recruitment process that um, to enable it to be effective on online. So, yes, what, I guess what, so what's the best kind of change you've seen out there that's happening way employers approaching this? And actually, I guess I guess those good things will stay in the future, won't they? We will see a change in, in behaviours. I think um, the best thing about the, the approach to digital selection is the engagement internally. You know, we were having these discussions on what many organisations were for a number of years in thinking actually having a an online platform you know, would at least allow efficiencies and, and speed as well as consistency. And we were getting pushback 
from, from colleagues in the business to kind of feel actually we still want that face-to-face -face contact. And I know this is something I've heard from other organizations who, who may be a bit further down the route than the most were before lockdown. But actually, we've all mostly been working pretty effectively from home. You know, we certainly, you know, in, in our in our business, senior colleagues have been able to win work and do bids and all the kind of stuff that they would have felt historically could only be done in a in a face-to-face -face environment. So that positive mindset change to be using you know digital technology to support attraction but in in, in the case where we you know, engage with in the selection to make those decisions through digital media on hiring you know apprentices and graduates uh, and the positive uh, approach and, and thought process that i think is, is 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 what's good because it will if you know i agree with nicola about the, the opportunity that those tools are can be maybe more equally accessible a simple fact being you know, for someone to have to travel from university to an interview from, say, you know, in, the, in the north of England down to our head office in London, that may be not hard, be harder to do for someone who's not harder for someone who's not as financially well off as, as another candidate. So actually, if you're doing that stage through uh, a digital platform, hopefully that's made it more inclusive. So I think that's definitely a positive. That actually, internal buy-in to digital attraction selection. It is definitely something that that I think is, is strong and uh, positive of what's, what people have to go through. Yeah, I've been speaking to a number of employers who've, who've seen so many benefits from virtual um, assessment centres um, and it's reduced the, the cost, the efficiency, the amount of time that it takes to get everybody to schedule all the assessors and candidates to get into, an, into a room together is, uh, is difficult, I'm sure loads of people appreciate, but so the efficiency is definitely there. Um, what I'd really be interested to see, and I don't know how we do this, is, is comparison of quality of hire. So a virtual um, hire compared to a, I don't know what you call them, non-virtual, normal, normal hire, um, when we, you know, a year down the road, just to yeah, see if there's any, yeah. actually any difference in the quality of the candidate. Um, and our, our virtual assessment tools as robust as normal traditional face-to-face -face methods. Yeah. So, yeah, that'd be good. But also on um, on the attraction side of things, I think my, my experience is mainly in the digital sector and we were already moving away from a lot of face to face activity um, and using sort of more data driven analytical tools to attract our candidates so that we could, for some roles, broaden our reach and for other roles be much more targeted where we're struggling to fill them more technical roles in certain locations. So we'd already sort of started that journey of moving away from doing a lot more face-to-face -face, um, activity and we're, we're, so I'd imagine that a lot of organisations are going to see the benefits of, of that kind of approach and continue doing that as well. Yeah. yeah. I guess there's a point whereby virtual may not be quite as perfect as face-to-face, -face, particularly when it comes to, to all aspects of recruitment, but if it's if it's almost as good that has these huge sort of efficiency and cost savings, actually it's going to be very hard to build those back into a budget unless there's a real, I guess, yeah. competitive reason I'd, to, to do that. I, I'd completely agree. I sort of compared it the other day in a conversation to why would you go back to queuing in a branch when you've been experiencing frictionless online banking for three months you ju you're just not going to reverse to having a carbon footprint that's huge <laughs> during the um during the uh, graduate season mm -hmm. you know wheeling senior people from campus to campus to campus there's there so many things that are as steph said so much more efficient um I, i'm not for one minute saying that actually it should be entirely virtual i just think actually you're not going to see i don't think a reverse um i think it will just be a perhaps a balance to a blend um that, that, that starts to um, that starts to appear. I mean, we've noticed, I guess, um, with the way in which our clients are using our technology, um, that, you know, we, we, we were talking to prospects for a number of months and suddenly, you know, the, the sales process has been really sort of quite, quite expedited. That said, I can't see that people will reverse to being face to face entirely um, if, if it's been a if it's been a success um, this year. Um, I also think this one of the other good things that's come from this this recent period of time i say good things you don't want people to be under constant stress of course you don't but one thing that has been super impressive when we talk to our clients is just how quickly they've moved and made decisions and how agile they've been with their thinking and how quickly their businesses have agreed to what needs to happen to keep that recruitment process going um and so if we can take some of that agility and 
um, remove some of the drama, obviously, but keep that quick decision making and that agility to respond to the market. I think that's definitely got to be something that would be useful to to, to hold on to moving forward. It's it's um, certainly been a, a crazy few months, but lots of creative thinking on the move. Have you seen the same, Vanessa? I mean, you are you are the heart of a creative, um, creative <laughs> rumble in, in, I guess, the most creative end of our, of our industry. Are you seeing that same agility and that that drive for innovation and change? Most definitely, yeah. Uh, so we've had a couple of campaigns where we've kind of had to to reconsider what we've done. So we had a campaign for a client that were looking to attract STEM graduates of 2020, um, and whilst that we're, we're still looking to appeal to that audience, we've actually kind of had to look: is there something more that we can be doing? Can we appeal to those who potentially may have lost their job due to COVID? Um, and how do we do that so we you know we're creating an online space and making sure that we're using social media to its strength um a lot of people are having these conversations without the organizations or the companies involved now is a good time as a company to get involved in those conversations kind of like set up a, a facebook group and kind of have a careers facebook group and um, reddit for example is something that would be that was happening into with one of our clients um people are, are people use it for entertainment but actually they kind of use it to help speak to other people that are in their career uh, or so I think it's really important that we look at that um, it's a different way of using digital space but it's definitely something that should be looked into and, and just um, just going back to you Nicola just we started talking mm. about sort of clients and what they need what they need help with you know, what are the key mm. things that, that your clients are asking for your support on at, at the moment yeah, sure. So it, it's following a bit of a cycle, actually, and it's it's quite an obvious one in the sense that obviously um, when we went and down into lockdown, I think a lot of organisations priority was we have interns and some placements coming up. How do we deliver that when they can't come to our office? So um, almost immediately we were looking at ways in which we were able to support virtual internships, for example, and summer placements. Um, and um, we had to be quite creative, actually, because obviously there are so many elements to when you go and spend three to six weeks with an organisation that you can't readily virtualise. But actually, um, we did arrive at um, some really good solutions for clients around delivering that internship um, um, during the summer. And then I guess the next bit of the cycle is now thinking about that autumn. Um, you know, if, if we can't be on campus potentially till 2021, and I know that's not um, for every campus, but is how do you run virtual events? How do you bring that to life, your organization to life online? So we're certainly seeing now a lot of planning, a lot of energy and interest going into the autumn and that sort of milk, what would have been traditional milk round and, and campus visits. So that's that's kind of where we are at the moment. Um, the other bit we have certainly seen um, is um, also that wrapper around what had to be a very quickly implemented virtual in, um, assessment process. So um, a number of organisations who had to pivot very quickly to um, take their assessment processes online. Um, we were seeing a lot of activity where they would bring cohorts of candidates together on our live chat to talk them through how to prep for it, answer their questions, get them ready, engage them, empower them in the process. And then very lastly, and Steph touched on this actually, about automation is for every job, if we're now going to see many more candidates coming through the process, and yet we still want to treat them with respect. Um, we want um, it to be a reciprocal and, 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 and um, enjoyable process. How can automation help that? Um, so we're seeing a lot of conversations around chatbots for FAQs, for example. Interestingly, we're also seeing our FAQ chatbots now we're developing and um, clients are developing areas of those chatbots to cover COVID related questions. Um, whether that's how did you look after your staff during the um, the uh, pandemic through to um, what can I expect and what's different this year. Um, but automation, given the volumes are higher and the teams are probably leaner in a lots of cases, I think is is, is certainly the other thing that we're, we're seeing a lot of activity around. So, um, yes, it feels like a cycle that we're going through. Um, uh, um, but yes, it's it's been a, a, an interesting conversation, in, interesting journey to go on. Michael, have you have you started planning for the autumn yet, or is that still in the in the slightly too um, um, almost too typical for you? Just need to have maximum flex at the moment. We we are planning because uh, we don't want to risk losing our exposure as a brand, and it's a tough sort of decision to make as to exactly how that how we can do that. We want to remain in in the in the eyes of, of potential students and school leavers. 
for next year but it's tricky because we may not have the clarity on specific roles in specific locations or disciplines by the autumn uh, so literally this is one we we're talking about actually let's start reaching out to the university departments we've had uh, a, a long-standing relationship just to have an open discussion what are their thoughts or have they already thought about opportunities that employees can engage with their students and we're also talking to our uh, some of our suppliers about that non-university specific approach uh, and also you know in, in similar space with, with school leaders and um, I think you know it's about having maybe more constructive conversations about that are more developmental for the for this for this potential applicant without necessarily yeah. saying okay, now you can apply for a job because helping people with employability is, is going to be positive even if they don't ultimately yeah. come and work and have a job because of what we've talked about earlier there is a need to support young people uh, yeah. you know with employability and it may not be that they can ultimately join us but if we've had some opportunity to just give them more education about even the roles in our sector because we're quite a uh, confusing sector a lot of stereotypes and people don't know about the opportunities that we have if we can have those constructive conversations even if they don't lead immediately to a job in the next sort of six to nine months that individual hopefully that's been benefit beneficial to them and if a point in time we do have confirmed vacancies we're a bit more on their radar and um, Vanessa just turns you with that the similar question that I asked Nicola you know um, we talked a bit about some of the stuff your clients are doing but what are, I guess what are the specifics that they're asking you to tackle what is it they, they really do need help with at the moment um I think um, fortunately a lot of the clients that we work with haven't had to pause on hiring it's just again on social media how do they um appear human how do they have conversations about what, what's going on in the world whether it's blm uh, that movement or covid itself um so making sure that we're really good with our messaging um so i think i said earlier one of our clients kind of had to to make sure that the the roles that we were posting um weren't ones that couldn't be carried out remotely um, and instead kind of use that opportunity to, to highlight the charitable things that they've been doing um, and I think brand ethos is so important in terms of hiring I think even if you've had to kind of take a sidestep at your normal plan just make sure that you're looking at what is engaging for your audience what can you do how can you show that you're a great company to work for so making sure that your audience is well, just knows that really um, that's how we've had to tackle it and are there any specific bits of advice you'd give your clients to do that? Because I guess sometimes it can be a little bit, clients need to be careful because there's a danger that you come across as inauthentic, just, you know, saying something for the sake of it to respond to, you know, whatever, the, whatever the hot topics of the day are in the headlines. Absolutely, yeah. So it's, it's known that Gen Z are very in tune with what's authentic and what's not so you kind of have to lean into what they're talking about and what they're saying and as a company um for example you may change your logo when it comes to pride month but what are you doing beyond that make sure that stuff is seen on your social on your websites and it's really echoed because i think that's really important to future talent and it's, it's what they're looking for essentially um and then another thing i'd say is um kind of show the other bits like i said before because that generation aren't afraid to change company change role so you kind of have to ensure that you're not going to just take them on and it's going to be cool for a year or so show what you can do for them show how you can grow and develop them and that's something that we've been making sure is is in our social channels for our clients um it, i think it's so important that we do that for them and then Nicola, are there any key bits of advice that you've got for your sort of clients at the moment, organisations that really want to continue attracting and engaging in this in this market? Yeah, I, I suppose um, the themes that um, um, we're, we're seeing is is that actually if, if clients can continue um, to communicate with their candidates, that's absolutely key. Even if they're updating them um, very honestly and transparently about where they're up to, if there's a delay, if there's a pause. Um, I, I kind of always, um, we always talk to our clients about the, the fact that obviously empathy and humanity are not, you know, you can give those at any time of the year through any circumstances. You know, if you think about candidates at the moment, particularly our future talent, they, 
that client might be one of 50 applications that the candidate's completed. They might not have heard back from any of those or just a fraction of those. Um, you know, they're worried about their future. They're gutted about the last five months of their studies. You know, everything's been disrupted for them. And so actually, if you can treat your candidates with respect, giving a bit of feedback, giving value at every stage, to Michael's point, whether they join you or not, you have given some value during that process and they will take from that um, um, a great deal. And, and actually, we are super surprised, um, or we shouldn't be, but we were surprised that candidates are grateful to hear from clients, even if the clients can't give them a solid update, can't tell them exactly what they want to hear, the fact they're communicating, the fact they're making an effort and, and keeping them involved in uh, in a conversation is really much, much appreciated. So um, doing something rather than nothing is absolutely um, what we're ad advising our clients to be doing when it comes to candidate communications in this space. Um, I have quite a, a few um, questions come through on the, on, the, on, the, on the questions box. So I was gonna turn to some, some of those right, right now. Um, because we've got about, about 10 minutes left by, by my clock. And um, I've had a couple of questions coming through about, um, about competencies and attributes that employers recruit to. So um, asking, um, are things like emotional resilience more necessary than ever now? And actually, and, and will and will the, the nature of the, of the skills and attributes that employers look for maybe change as a result of this? And I wonder if it's too early to tell, but I wonder if, if Steph, if I can turn to you first, if you've got any thoughts on, on that. Yeah, I don't know from a candidate's perspective, but I think very much from a, 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 a can, sorry, from a candidate's perspective, it probably is because I, I'm seeing more and more that candidates are wanting to know what organisations have been doing through. So when they're assessing an employer, if they want to work for them, they want to know, you know how they supported their their um, employees. Um, but also I'm seeing um, from the people that I've been speaking to is they're interested in what candidates have been doing during lockdown and how have they used their time um, to do test around self growth and things like that. Have they learned something new or have they um, supported somebody else in their community? So I, um, yeah, it is a bit early to tell, but that's the sort of things I'm seeing being introduced into processes from both sides, candidates and employers. I don't know that Michael, you've, you've Sorry, yeah, adapted your process, Michael, um, at all um, in response to COVID. I, th I think, well, you know, we had the luxury of not having to make that decision because we we closed our recruitment. So we had a lot of offers already at the time. So we haven't actually been recruiting yeah. in, in lockdown, but to the point about looking ahead to next year, you know, I think there will be a need to look at that. And, and for us, it will be, to my point earlier, would it be the technical skill that we need to see more of? You know, familiarity with with you know digital technology either embedded within academic study mm. or, or mm. specifically post academic study um but i think there's also is it easier or harder to come across well online to to an employer you know and how will our stakeholders respond because obviously we've had sort of the the things we look for in candidates and that's been relatively yeah. established at least for the last couple of years how will that be different how will our colleagues who are, you know, are assessing be thinking about candidates because some candidates, for example, you know, they, often the, the question I'm sure we all get is, oh yeah, will I have them in front of one of my clients? Is is you, you often the benchmark that, that colleagues use? But actually, how successful are those colleagues being in front of their clients now that they're not seeing them face to face? They're not going into the client offices or, or up the former work for communication. Therefore, does that change what we need to see? In, in, in our new colleagues coming through but then how much of a change is needed on the basis will we go back to certain ways of working because actually at a point in time when people feel safe to do so people just retreat back to that yeah. approach and, and therefore would we be doing too much to change on the basis that the change isn't sustained in how we need to work um i think certain core behaviors and approaches and competencies to use that phrase are pretty consistent whether you're working in an online environment or in a physical environment but i, I think yeah we would certainly be interesting to see how we get when we get into those discussions internally running up to recruiting for next year hopefully uh mm. how, how discussion goes so i think i need to say i think lots of food for thought yeah, I, I think um, I read an article actually a couple of weeks ago around um, what's needed for successful virtual teams. And obviously, I think there's going to be a bit around um, line management 
training as well as um, you know candidates um, having the right um, right capabilities and, and behaviors I mean for instance being able to work independently having self-motivation and being able to manage your time when you're perhaps not in the same environment as the rest of your team and likewise for hiring managers um, clarity being able to trust <laughs> being able to I think it's going to be a really interesting and I think that's for all of us not just for future talent actually but I think that is something that's going to be interesting to watch is how both line managers and, and, and employees adjust to what could be a semi-virtual world um, yeah. given quite a few organizations won't be reopening their offices to the same capacity they were previously. Uh, Vanessa is this see something you see coming through into sort of I guess the campaigns you're creating you know this um, I guess the, the nature of the, the candidate that employers are looking particularly to, to target um, yeah, but it has been some of that we've seen. Um, so, sorry, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, sorry, do you mind coming back to me? Yeah, that's what no, I'm going to spot there. I've got there a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I'm just going to um, uh, another question I've had here on on processes, and it's around feedback action, feedback for, for for candidates. And I think there's um there's a worry that actually with everything moving more and more virtual, automated, and the pressure on on teams, that actually there might be less feedback being given to to, to candidates. Um, is that again? Is that something? Is that a, a concern that anybody anybody shares, or actually does technology give the opportunity to give more feedback? You know, I think by using things like Zoom and, and audio. I might have a slightly biased view on this, but I think if you have the right technology, the opportunity is greater than it's ever been. And I don't just mean us. I mean, and Steph, I know that, and, and Michael, you have great experience of the tech stacks that you've put together in your in your businesses. Um, there shouldn't be an excuse at the moment for not giving some kind of feedback because even the most basic tools should be able to give you some kind of ability to feedback. And even if it's, um, and sorry, that's a huge sweeping statement, but I genuinely think that is something that technology and the current situation should enable us to be better at than ever. Both empowering people before assessment and feeding back to them after assessment. That's, that would be my view. Sorry, not that I'm passionate about it or anything, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you're totally right. I mean, yeah, everybody should be giving feedback if they've reached the final stage at the very minimum. Um, it's only fair to the candidate if they've invested in, in the company that, that you give something in return and um, if they're not successful, then, then it helps them for the future. Um, and I, I know I talked earlier about, you know, we've got this big funnel to deal with and that's more workload, but we should be achieving efficiencies at that, that final stage with not having to organise physical assessment centres. So um, hopefully that can be offset against the time that's needed to give the candidates yeah. feedback. But it, doesn't, it really doesn't take long to, to give candidate a little bit of feedback and um, on how they can improve for, for the future. And there are varying degrees of feedback, aren't there? I mean, there, is, yeah. there are many candidates who don't hear back at all mm, yeah they're not we've even we've received yeah. your <laughs> your application so at one end of the scale we've got common courtesy all the way through to what Steph's just saying there which is next time actually or these are the areas that you were great at these are the areas you could improve in I mean you've yeah. got a spectrum of feedback that you could be giving but common courtesy should be the bare minimum <laughs> at the moment mm. that's for sure <laughs> Do you agree with all that, Michael? Because it is a challenge delivering feedback. You know, when you've got multiple candidates to deal with, and and you know, and resources are under pressure. Um, I think Steph's point is the absolute. You know, I'm really in strong agreement with that. You know, the more a candidate invests, I think the expectations go up, and and it, we you know, we're looking at you know, engaging for the first time with virtual in the stage the selection centres, and and part of um, the sort of way we're appraising the different offerings in the market is actually understanding what the tech the system can provide in that space and actually through, through speaking to other employers you know the ability for the assessors to actually provide feedback in a structured way but actually in it's a, it's that's efficient for them you know not using handwritten notes and be able to kind of upload comments you know instantaneously or quite quickly just makes that process easier so our expectations where we've had to spend more time doing it because for us that was really important to do it at the very least at the final stage 
so that's going to be easier for us so for us it's actually more of a concern at the earlier stage to the point of if you've got that many more people and the process is more automated although it's from our perspective maybe you know, light touch it's really important to a candidate that stage is yeah for them at that point that's the most important stage of application so i think the challenge for us will be how do we make uh, feedback at the earlier stages of our funneling process as relevant as it can be but efficient for us i yeah. think the final is absolutely a no-brainer and it should be the standard that we're going we're lucky enough to be able to go to that but it's earlier on because still that brand is still main yeah, is impacted by someone who may never go beyond that first stage with you yeah. and that's the challenge I think having, I think having a really good application tracking system is key to that as well so it's yeah tracking every single candidate where they are making sure they're getting tailored communications um and there's some really good yeah ats's out there and there's some really bad ats's out there which i have much experience on so um yeah choosing a good ats that's going to uh yeah give you what you need and is tailorable and make sure that candidates don't fall into holes and get forgotten about is super important I agree and I think it's important that you do that because their skill sets may be the right fit for you at a later date but if you've had if they've had a tainted experience with you the first time round, they're not going to work with want to work with you again and in fact word of mouth goes a long way if uh, if somebody says to you I work for this company or I've had this experience they were really good they were really supportive some like they're more likely to go do you know what I'll have a go I'll, I'll look to work with them um but you've already you've already cut yourself off um if, if you do that if you're not responding if you're not engaging with them so yeah please exactly. do it <laughs> and I guess Vanessa on social media that that kind of that chatter that noise is amplified you know than it would have been in the past so if you give that bad experience more people are going to, going to hear about it Absolutely. You know, you'll, you'll see Reddit threads about companies and um, TikTok even joined on the hype of the big fours, people exposing the big fours. So it's really important what you're doing because you may not be involved in that, that side and see that. But that, that social trail lingers for such, such a long time. Mm. The same with Glassdoor. Um, people that interview, they're leaving reviews on Glassdoor. So whether they go on to work for you or not, they're openly telling anybody who you actually want to work for you what your company may really be like and that you know it's just not right they generally only put a glass door review on if they've had a bad experience I think. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely yeah, so yeah just... <laughs> um we um, and i had a comment here from jess online actually also from going back to this feedback piece that you know with gdpr subject access requests that actually it's in everybody's best interest you know to supply really good feedback you know to candidates in the, in the process um, we're almost on the hour, so I'm just going to wrap up with a final question to you all. You know, this webinar is about the early careers candidate experience, you know, both now and beyond. So I wonder if you could just sort of um, quickly cast your minds forward to, to this time next year, you know, July, August um, 2020. Hopefully we're, uh, we're out and about a little bit more and something's returned to normal. But I wonder what will have sticks. So I wonder what you think we'll be doing this time you know, next year that, that might be different to how we were doing it maybe, maybe a, a year ago. Um, Michael, can I pick on you first? I think it will be a blended experience between virtual and face-to-face. -face. You know, getting the best of both worlds to be efficient, to be inclusive, but at some point to build engagement on both sides of, a, of an employer and, 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 a, and a new student. I think, again, I may be coming across old-fashioned, but I think, you know, you can't replace some of the wider environmental things you get from that. So it'll be a blended approach will see uh, more common moving forward. So a blended approach from Michael. Steph, what do you think? Um, I think, yeah, same, same as what Michael said. I think there is going to be uh, more, more virtual processes. But what I'm hoping to see is with the more investment in um, a focus on apprenticeships, um, mm -hmm that um, there'll be hopefully some changes to the levy, <laughs> hopefully be a bit of a reform around that so that um, give employers the flexibility they need to make apprenticeships successful. But I also hope that there's less stigma in, around apprenticeships um, and that people start to see it as a really viable alternative to university because I think that still there's some um, misconceptions around apprenticeships and, and who should go into apprenticeships. But um, so, yeah, hoping that there, there'll be a bit more positivity about apprenticeships providing a really good yeah, career, future career path for people. Yes, I think lots of people agree with that on the apprentice piece. There's a whole other webinar in that, isn't there, Steph? So <laughs> we won't go there. Um, Vanessa, 
What's um what's your prediction for, for this time next year? Um, I think that remote working is going to become a bigger part of our working lives and the way that we operate. So I think a lot of a lot of us have benefited from it, whether it means that you're no longer commuting or you know, you're able to look after your children or spend different hours with them. I think that's been great. But I think that can be used to to widen your your talent pool and um, mm -hmm. so according to the house of commons disability um, and employment report from earlier this year uh, people with disabilities who have a degree are less likely to be in employment than those without a disability with gcse's grade a to c that's a deficit there that, that that to me was quite shocking and um, they have the capability why are they not being employed so now that we are able to work remotely i think that's something that could be looked into better um provide an opportunity for somebody who couldn't necessarily get into your office before but is capable to do the role mm. thanks Vincent. and nicola lastly to yourself yeah, it's difficult because everyone's made such a good point. Yeah, I can just agree with everyone else. But no, um, I, I think what I'm really hoping in a year's time is that the same um, businesses have really relied on the agility and the energy of resourcing and talent acquisition at a time like this. And so I'm hoping that that is completely sustainable and that in a year's time, um, talent acquisition, and um, particularly in the early career space, are as highly valued as they are now in terms of their ability to make quick decisions and be creative under pressure. So I'm optimistic. No, that is a brilliant note to end on. Thank you very much. So thank you, Nicola. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Thank you, Steph. Thank Lovely you, Vanessa. Lovely to see you. Just, just <laughs> Cheers, on. guys. Great to have a really good, rich conversation. And I do appreciate you sort of taking, taking the time out um, so a Pleasure. final reminder, by later this afternoon or tomorrow, um, this webinar will, um, will be on our YouTube channel. We'll send the link round to all of you um, who registered for the event. Um, so as I said at the start of this, please do share. And please keep a look out for all our future webinars and podcasts, because a lot of the, the topics we discussed here, you know, around apprenticeships, around, um, you know, um, virtual recruitment, etc. We have a lot more content on that already and we'll be bringing more to you all. So, so thank you very much to you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Bye, Bye now. Guys. Take care. Bye.